Welcome to the Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva, and today we're going to get some insight into softball. My guest today is Jackie Timko. She's the head softball coach at Ryder University, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem. So, usually I start my guests uh, where they went to college. So, where'd you go to school? So I'm originally from Western PA, so um, Pittsburgh kid, born and raised. Um, so there's a school called Robert Morris University, which is about 20, 20 minutes like outside of Pittsburgh, um, which is where I went to school for my undergrad, and then I got my master's there as well. So. Oh, great. Fantastic. Yeah. So um, let's go back in time. Okay. Um, in high school. Mm -hmm. How did you end up picking uh, Robert Morris University? So it was really funny um, when I look back now how I got at Robert Morris. Um, so I went to a really small high school. I mean, I was like one of a hundred kids there. Everyone knew their brother, their sister, what they ate for dinner. That's how close and how small we were. Um, so whenever I was looking for, sco like for schools, universities, I was like, I want to go someplace big. Um, I went out to a camp to, you know, as, as a softball player, went out to a camp to a really big university. And I was just kind of blown away. I felt like such a big fish. <laughs> it felt like such a small fish in such a big, big place. So it just wasn't really comfortable for me. Yeah. Um, I then ended up at a small tournament and uh, the head coach from Robert Morris was there. And he was just like, hey, have you ever heard of us? I was like, honestly, I've, I've never heard of Robert Morris University. <laughs> and lo and behold, you know, it was a small uh, D1 school. Um, again, just right in my backyard. It was about 45 minutes away from my house. Um, went on to campus, and I fell in love with it there. So, really? yeah, fantastic. small world. Had no idea I was there. As soon as I went there, you know, it was hard for me to actually leave. Wow, so. fantastic. So now you're at Robert Morris University. Mm -hmm. You end up uh, graduating. How do you go from there to becoming the head coach at Rider University in New Jersey? Yeah, so um, it was really funny. Whenever I was in my undergrad, um, I was not, if you have asked me if I was going to be a softball coach, I would have probably laughed at you. I was saying, there's no way that I could do that as a job. Um, so my last game that I ever played as a softball, wearing the Robert Morris University um, uniform, was a 14-inning game. Um, it was a game that we lost um, it was such a heartbreak. It was on our home field. It was part of the, the NEC conference uh, championship game. So I walked off that field and I was like, there's no way that could ever be my last moment playing softball. And uh, my head coach, Craig Coleman, he goes to me, he goes, hey, you know, I'm looking for a graduate assistant. Would you like to coach? I think you'd be really good at it. And I was like, uh, yeah, like this is perfect. So um, I, I you know, I started my coaching career there for two years oh. um, as I was working towards my master's. And then, um, lo and behold, my my fiance, who's my now husband, got a job out in New Jersey. So um, packed up, came out here to New Jersey. Um, I started my first head coaching job at a D3 school called New Jersey City University. Mm -hmm. And then um, it was kind of like a weird thing. I was just kind of on the internet one day. Next thing you know, I saw that the writer head coaching job was open. Um, you know, I made a couple phone calls. And next thing you know, in January, I was interviewing. Um, and I started wow. a couple weeks after that. So Fantastic. So you've been there just a year? Yes, just a year oh, now. Oh, wow. So you just finished up a, a season last year? Correct, yes. Okay, and uh, how good is the team so far? So, um, you know what? We can only go up. And I'll put, it, I'll put it that way, is uh, we've had uh, a little bit of turmoil in the fact that it's, it hasn't been a very successful um, couple years for us. So right now it's kind of just about rebuilding the culture, rebuilding the team, and kind of just making a new name for Ryder Softball, which okay. um, we had a really successful fall, um, you know, kind of gearing towards that, where, you know, the momentum's moving for the spring, so we're really excited about that. Fantastic. Yeah. So now let's go into uh, high school. Um, okay. How do you go about finding high school softball players? You know what? The recruiting game right now is so tough. Um, and I do, I feel for these kids now. Um, I do a lot of these recruiting talks at these camps and showcases. And I tell them, I said, you know, I was in your shoes not, not too long ago, about six years ago. And I said, there's no way that I would want to switch places with you. This has become a full-time job. Um, not only are you expected to, to, you know, go to high school and be a good student, you then are expected to, you know, have a social life, do all your extracurricular activities, you know, those sports, those practices, and then find time to do your homework and sleep. Not only on top of that, then look for universities and stuff like that to start the next four years of life. It's madness. Um, and so I, I tell them, I, you know, keep keep at it. You know, find find those schools that you absolutely love, mm -hmm. and you know, get reach out to me. So then that way I know hey, you know, this person's like really, really interested in me, so I'm gonna go to every opportunity that I possibly can. So high school games, travel ball games, practices, um, all these tools that I use, you know, even, even in high school now, um, 
th that helps me kind of narrow down my list. So now, what are some of the requirements that a, that a school like Rider University looks for in a softball player? In a softball player, I'm looking for passion. Um, so again, as I'm rebuilding my program, I'm not looking for the absolute best player. I want the one that's going to go out there and says, you know what, I'm here to make a difference. Um, again, it, whenever you come here, I, I play the best nine. So the ones that, that want to be there, that do the hard work, that, that get good grades, um, you know, those are the type of athletes that I'm looking for, the ones that want to go out there, not just kind of stand up on the sidelines. They just want to go out there and they just want to play, give 100%. So now what is, what is uh, good grades for a high school athlete? Good grades, you know, A's and B's you know, our, our good grades. Um, you know, that kind of gives us a good kind of tell sign of how you'll do in, in college and in academics. Um, because I always say this too, is that you do all this work trying to get good grades to get into university. It doesn't stop there. Um, you know, every university has APRs and, and things that we get graded on based on their performance, not only on the, on the field, but also in the classroom. So um, my program's a little bit strict. Uh, just because whenever I was a player at Robert Morris University, we had the highest GPA in all Division I. Um, so that's something that I'm very proud of. Um, so that's something that I kind of like to gear towards my teams too. So, you know, making sure that we have a study hall. Um, if you fall below a 3.0 in, in within the year, I then put you in a softball study hall. So, you know, just to keep an eye on you, just to make sure that you're doing the things that you should be doing. Because at the end of the day, they're going to ask you what's your GPA, not what your batting average is. Yeah. So. Good. So now um, they're in. They're in at Rider University. Yeah. Um, give me a sense of the twelve months that a student athlete goes through. Um, when do they get to the school? Mm -hmm. What happens throughout the year, all the way until the following year? Yeah, no problem. So. Uh especially whenever you come into the fall. So fall usually for us starts in September. I give you that kind of that first week to kind of get adjusted to your classes because it's very overwhelming. Um, a lot of the times I'll sit down, especially with the freshmen, just kind of talk to them just a little bit. Hey, how are your classes going? Are you able to find your building? What's going on with your roommates? Just kind of get to know them a little bit just because, um, you know, I've been watching them all summer play. Now it's time that we can talk face to face. So that's why I do the first week. Um, we usually have a team meeting, and then from there, you know, we do get a couple weeks in the fall. Um, the NCAA does allow us a couple weeks in the fall to kind of practice. So we do, we practice, we have a couple games. We're allowed to play at least eight games in the fall. Okay. So um, we schedule that, and that kind of takes us all the way up until um, mid of October. Okay. Um, you know, with the practice, we practice five days of the week. And again, we have double headers on the weekends. Okay. So come mid-October, I then give them another kind of week off. And then we go right heavy into our workouts. So this year we did have 6 a.m. workouts, so they weren't really thrilled about that, but they were kind of <laughs> happy whenever they were over um, just because, you know, they got done quick and out of the way in the morning. Sure. So um, we worked out two days of the week, and then again we did individual work. So we just did individual work. It was one-on-one. -on -one. Me and my assistant coach, we kind of worked with them in small groups, gave them that one-on-one -on -one attention that they need and, you know, just kind of caught up on life a little bit. And that took us all the way up until um, December, which was, you know, finals and then Christmas break. Right. So it goes by really fast the first semester and a lot of them cannot realize it. Yeah. Um, as much as that first semester goes by fast, second semester just, it, it goes like that. Um, so we don't come back until January, end of January, so January 22nd this year. Um, mm -hmm. From there, we kind of hit the ground running. Um, we have one day where we'll do a team meeting, the rest we practice. So again, we practice six days out of the week. Um, and then come February, we start traveling for our tournaments. Mm -hmm. um, so February, March, we have um, out of conference, tournaments and then come April, April all the way into the first week of May, we are playing double headers. Wow. Um, so it's 56 games in total, which is a lot to, to kind of manage. But, um, you know, besides with classes and practice and the games, it kind of goes by a little bit yeah. fast. So, and then what happens in the summertime? Do they have to go and play on a sub summer league? Or? So I don't, I don't um, make that mandatory. Some of the girls actually do play on like a 23 and under team or just something, just a pickup team a little bit. Um, a lot of the girls that I do, I encourage them to go out and coach, um, get involved with either a youth team or a travel ball team or, you know, give back somehow just because it, it really kind of helps you as a player take a step back. And if you're teaching the same things that you're supposed to be doing, it makes you think about it in a different light. So that's something I encourage them to do. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So now what happens when you go on these uh, tournaments outside mm -hmm. in uh, February, March, being yeah. that I guess it's cold here. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's that's why you're traveling somewhere else. Yes. Uh, what happens with schoolwork? How, how do they handle that? Yes. So um, in the beginning of the year, we give the our student athletes a letter that they are to give to the professors and says that I will be missing from such and such days out of class. Um, it is then the student athlete's responsibility to make sure that they um, talk to that professor and whether or not a finished assignment is due. Um, when the due date will be. Most of the professors are actually really understanding of athletes um, and they work with the athletes. Um, you know, um, I always say that, again, your academics comes first. So it doesn't matter how well you are as a player. If you're not getting the good grades, then you're not going to be able to play out in the field or, you know, kind of give it 100% of everything that you have. Um, so that being said, we do have some quiet time on the bus um, where we do our studying and our homework, uh, especially on those long trips. Um, but for the most part, you know, it's, it's we kind of light heavy on the student athletes to give their professors that note um, saying that, you know, you guys got to find a way to work it out, yeah. get your homework done. Yeah. Great. So now, uh, when you go to uh, high school games and recruit, mm -hmm. um, is it is it uh, just the high school uh, softball games or is it outside uh, summer leagues and things like that? Where do you do most of your recruiting? Is it just in the New Jersey, Pennsylvania area or is it all over the whole country? How does it all work? Yeah, so um, I'm a little bit different than most people, whereas a lot of um, a lot of softball programs will look, you know, they look for the kids from California and Florida and all over the place. Me, when I was at Robert Morris, when I was in Pittsburgh, I was driving out to New Jersey, I think, every other weekend to come out recruiting. So this is such, the Tri-State area is such an awesome spot for softball. Um, so I love it. It's a lot easier for me to travel because, again, it's a little bit more local. Um, and I'm able to go to more tournaments that way because, again, there are some big tournaments that I know a lot of tra college coaches travel, um, especially in the summer, out this way for. So okay. um, to me, yeah, I, I love it out here just because the talent is, is huge. And what, and what are you looking for in the, in the students? Again, I just, I'm looking for that passion, that, that effort. Um, I understand that you're going to make mistakes. I'm not looking to, for you to go there and be perfect. That's the number one thing that I stress to everyone. I said, please don't, please don't suddenly just kind of get all poker face and lose your personality. Because again, I think you play softball the best when you're having fun. Um, you're enjoying what you're doing. You know, no one's like forcing you to be out there to do it. Okay. Yeah. You, you want to be out there. You want to, you want to get better. You just, you just want to win. Those are the type of things I'm looking for. How do you bounce back if you mess up? Um, okay. Did you strike out? Was it a good strikeout? Was it quality at bat? Again, like I'm not looking for the home run hitters. I'm looking for the ones that go out there and I can tell that they want to be there. And what kind of opportunities are at Ryder University for softball players? Um, is there is there scholarships? Is there money? Is there nothing? How, how does it work at the college? Yeah, level? no. So um, so each so there are three divisions, right? Division one, division two, division three. Um, division three, there is no scholarship money for athletics. Now there is scholarship money for academics. Division two and division one have scholarship money for athletics and academics. So um, especially at Ryder, what we like to do is we give you a package. Um, so again, based on your good uh, academic grades, you'll get some money from Ryder from your academics, and then I'll throw in a softball. Um, some softball money on top of that to create a really competitive package. Yeah, so now it, it, it's not like football and basketball where they get full scholarships. Right. They, they, they get halves or quarters or right. they, they don't get a full scholarship. Correct, yeah, no, um, this is one of the myths they always have to bust again when I do all these recruiting talks. They say, you know, that, that idea of a full ride anymore does not exist. Um, unless you play basketball or again like football, another big, big time school like that where your rosters are kind of either small or it's expected to get a full ride from that. Um, some of the smaller sports like softball, soccer, stuff like that. Fortunately, they're not, they're not really um, available. So now the, you do a lot of recruiting nights. Is is that what you were saying before? So we uh, so it's not technically like a, a recruiting night. We do like a recruiting camp. So um, like this weekend, no, I'm sorry, the 14th, January 14th, we will actually be hosting a winter clinic at our indoor facility. So again, that's a great time for student athletes to come on campus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they get to work with me, my staff, and some of my team. See, if, you know, they like our style. Get to know some of our drills. And again, I kind of give a little spiel on on recruiting talk there. So interesting. Yeah. So now, what do you uh, say about parents that say it's all about uh, the sport? not mm -hmm. about academics. Well, what do you what do you tell parents about that? You know, I always say it, it, it's amazing that, you know, they do put a lot of pressure on on the sport itself whenever, you know, 
the sport won't last forever, right? They got to do this because they absolutely love it. And that pressure that you're putting on them just to make sure that they go out and play will kind of hurt them in the end because then they're going to fall out of love of that sport. Um, so one of the things, especially whenever they get to college is, you know, I always say, why do you play, right? Because if it's mom and dad that are making you play, then you're not, you're not going to enjoy it. Because again, most of the time you get four years after this, unless, you know, they did ask softball back to the Olympics. So, or, you know, and the pro league is kind of growing big, but the majority of us, you know, after those four years, you'll lace up your cleats for the last time and, you know, then you'll start into the real world. Yeah. Um, I do think that sports give you a lot of good core values, stuff like that, that can translate into the workforce. But again, at the end of the day, you play it because you love it and it's fun. Um, so I do, I, I feel for those. I feel for the students yeah. that that parents are like, no, it's you know all or nothing. Go out there and you know, that's it. Ride or die in your sport. <laughs> but you know, at the end of the day, I think that there needs to be a balance a little bit. So now, is there any type of benefits that a student athlete gets at the college level compared to an academic student? You know what? It's it, the one thing that I would say. It kind of makes you a little bit more rounded. I think that you get to learn your time management a lot faster than than an average student. Um, I also do think that you get a different experience. So again, whenever you're sitting down with an employer, you can actually say, "Hey, I've been a part of a team for the past four years. Um, I know how to work in a different setting. I know how to work under pressure." So those are type of things that, although. Um, you know, I think every every student is just kind of like, well, you know, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm going to do the things that the average student gets to do. At the end of the day, it kind of gives them a little bit more of an, of an advantage. I yeah. Think. What's the what's the differences that you see between uh, an academic student who just goes to school for academics compared to student athletes? Um, I think they're caught up on sleep for one. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's sad to say, but again, you know, between your workouts and you know either having a job on campus, practice, and all that kind of stuff like that. Um, I do think that time is one of those things. Time is of the essence, at least for a student athlete. So everything is kind of programmed down to the very, very minimum. Um, whereas, you know, an average student, if you, you get to choose to be part of activities or clubs or, you know, you get to spend your free time how you want to, yeah. they don't have a coach like me telling them, all right, it's time to do this right now. Yeah. So I think that I think that's one thing that they have. Great. So now, um, tell me a little bit about the, the university itself. Yeah. Um, why do kids come to Rider University? You know, uh, one of the things that um, I think that attracts students to Rider is not only one, the one of reputation of, of some of our schools, so like our business school, Westminster um, Choir College. I, those are great things to have. Um, our biology program is one of the tops in the state. Um, those are all things I think draw people to the campus, and I think whenever they get on campus, they realize, hey, this is a Division One university, but it's such a small town feel that you kind of, again, it's intimate. So our class sizes are not that big. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your professor knows your name. They know that you're a student athlete. They know what clubs you're involved in. So I think that to me is a little bit um, special. You don't get really to have that in a lot of big universities or big Division One universities. Um, Ryder can offer a little unique sense in that. Yeah, and uh, the closeness to New York City, yeah. Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. I mean, our proximity is awesome. So, again, they're able to hop on the train in an hour and a half, be in New York, or, you know, 45 minutes away from Philadelphia. So there's a lot to do. That is one thing that everyone's always asked, like, oh, what does there do around here? I'm like, there's a lot of things to do. You <laughs> just have to, you know, find what you're interested in or find what you want to do. Yeah, and so what are some of the um, schools that, that Rider University plays against? Yeah, so um, in our conference, we have schools, um, Marist, which is in New York. Um, let's see here, putting me on the spot, Sienna, <laughs> um, Niagara, Canisius, uh, Mammoth is also, also there, Sacred Heart. Great. Um, yeah, so these are, all, again, all kind of small private Division One schools yeah. um, are, that are in our conference. Um, and then also we do play some bigger name schools. So we do play Princeton. We play Army. We play, um, I'm trying to think of who else we played in. So in those are out of conference yeah, schools. Yeah, out of conference schools, yeah. Okay. So um, uh, recruiting, um, do you go everywhere or do you pretty much stay in the general vicinity? How does that work? Yeah, so I um I, I pretty much travel with anywhere within PA, New Jersey, Delaware, um, in New York. So I kind of go out, um, kind of branch myself out. Again, what's really big for me is if you're going to take the time to email me, um, and say, hey, I really want you to come watch me play. I'm going to find a way to come to the field that you're at. 
Yeah, good. Now, do you, do you, uh, do you go to a lot of high school games or that it's real difficult because you're playing the same season? It's a little bit hard for me to go out um, in during the high school season just because you're correct. And, you know, we are playing our own games. Um, but there are some rare occasions where I do have an off day where I'll go swing by and, you know, check out a game. Is it nearby? Do, do you get to the schools farther away or is it pretty much when you have a day off or anything like that? It's when I have a day off or if I can plan it, then yeah, I mean, if there's a school that's probably an hour away from here, I'm going to try to make it. Um, I'll, I'll kind of rework my schedule around so that I'm able to go. But And what's the, what's the, what's the uh, team atmosphere? How, do, how does the team atmosphere work at, at Ryder? Yeah, so like our team atmosphere, I always say, you know, this is part of your family, right? So you might not get along with every member of your family, but at the end of the day, you're family. Um, so we're very positive, we're very encouraging, especially during practice. Um, I want them to push each other. Um, at the same time, I also want them to empower one another too. So again, you're walking away from practice feeling like you gave 100%. Um, even if you're not at 100% that day, you gave me 100% of what you did have. And then your teammates are there to kind of pick you up or feed off each other. So um, one thing that I do about my practice is I keep them short. So um, two hours is the max. I think that, you know, again, with that whole time management thing, I think after two hours you kind of lose your luster, you kind of go through repetitive emotion. So I expect that atmosphere to be positive, uplifting for those two hours and, you know, get the best out of it. And what's the what's the practice like? Is it just like uh, batting and then fielding and then a little bit of running or something? Or yeah. how, how does it all come? <laughs> you know what? It kind of depends on um, that day or you know what I think that we need to work on most. Um, some days you know we'll spend an hour and a half on hitting. Um, other days you know we'll spend a lot an hour and a half on on fielding or you know whatever it is. I think that we need a little bit more time or energy on. You know we kind of craft it, craft oh. it to our needs there. And it, um, there's a there's a lot of uniqueness at the at the college level compared to at the high school level, yeah. um, like throwing. Mm -hmm. um, do you look for more pitchers, catchers? How, how does that all work? Yeah, no. So they say to really build um, a great program, you need your middles um, to be to be solid. So that's a pitcher, catcher, your shortstop, your second baseman, your center fielder. You have a solid core in the middle. You can build around it. Um, so again, you know. Pitching is huge in softball. Um, so again, if you have someone that's strong on the mound, and I'm not even saying that you need to throw, you know, 65 or something crazy. Um, yeah. If you just have that strong presence that you just want to be out there and you want control, you're going to do well. If you have confidence in yourself out there, then you'll succeed. And what what's the amount of uh, students that you have to recruit to get a, a class of people to come in? You know what? I, every every program is a little bit different of how they can hold their roster size. Um, right now, I have 20 girls on my team. So I like anywhere between 18 to 20 on my roster. Um, again, I think whenever you kind of get up in the higher 20s, it's a little bit hard just for playing time purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to make sure that everyone's happy. And a majority of those 18 to 20, you know, I'm looking to have a good core of pitchers. So like this year, um, I have three senior pitchers. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have two freshman pitchers. So I have a staff of five, which is really, really nice. Um, but whenever those three graduate, you know, I only have two, and then we're bringing in, luckily, you know, for the class of 2017. Yeah. Is that how the opportunity works at the college level? If uh, two or three pitchers are graduating, are you looking for two or three more pitchers down the road? And, yeah. You know, if outfielders uh, graduate, do you look for more outfielders? How, how does that all work? Yeah, no, so you kind of nailed it a little bit. So, again, like my, my graduating class this year, I'm going to be losing uh, three pitchers. Um, an outfielder in my shortstop. So again, whenever I'm going out recruiting, I'm looking to either replace those or trying to think of, okay, well, if I move, you know, such and such from third base over to shortstop now, who can play third base? Yeah. So again, it's all kind of about where you see your team going. It's a little bit of a puzzle, um, but it's a fun puzzle to yeah. at least kind of try to put together. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds uh, difficult as well as fun between, yeah. <laughs> between both, right? Right, yeah. Um, how about coaching staff? Is it... Uh, What's your coaching staff like? Yeah, so right now it's myself. Um, I have a pitching coach and I have one volunteer coach. Um, you know, there's a running joke right now that we're kind of like the youngest coaching staff in Division One, but it, it's kind of we kind of like it um, just because we're able to do a lot more. We're very hands-on at practice, um, so we're not just going to sit there and bark orders at you. We're going to show you, hey, no, it needs to be done this way. So that's one of the things I really kind of like about my staff is that um, my assistant, she just graduated from Villanova, was one of the top pitch. Um, coming out of Villanova. Wow. Um, 
amazing, amazing athlete. She actually no hit us last year, so that's why I was like, hey, I need you, I need you on my staff, I need you to hire you, teach, teach your ways. So she graduated and then became an yeah. assistant at your school. Yes. That's fantastic. Yeah. So it's a real small uh, community of coaching that you pull from other schools as well. Yes, yes. Fantastic. So we're coming to the end of our show, and uh, usually I ask my guests, um, what advice do you want to give to families that their daughters are interested in going to college to play softball? Yeah, so the biggest thing that I, I say is I have five schools. Have five schools that you absolutely love. So they have your major, um, they have the community size that you want, they have classroom sizes, everything about the university you have to absolutely love. Softball needs to be a bonus. And then go attack those five schools. Um, email that coach. Send that coach that schedule. Um, give the coach a phone call. As, as uncomfortable as it is, you know, pick up the courage to get that phone call. Um, show that coach that they're interested. And then it's okay if you hear the word no. If that coach is full in that class, just be okay with the word no because when one door closes, another door will open up. So again, just trying to be optimistic, keep that open mindset, and really kind of go after what you want. That's the biggest thing. And again, that passion, you know, again, you're picking the next four years of your life. You get to be selfish, right? You get to pick these next four years. That's true. So pick something that you absolutely love and something that you want to do, and then you'll enjoy your time. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming on yeah, the show. No problem. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, no problem. So you've been watching The Secrets of College Planning. I'm your host, Anthony Uva. Until next time.